Today's program is being recorded. Any views expressed in this webinar are for general educational purposes only and do not represent any official views or positions of the sponsor or presenter's organization. Greetings and welcome to today's educational program using the seven basic quality tools by Sandy Fitterer and Doug Wood. This is your moderator Shobha Mittal with the SQ Quality Management Division. Today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Sandy and Doug. Please join me in welcoming them. I will only introduce Doug and then Doug is going to do the honors for Sandy. So here I go. Mr. Wood has worked over 40 years in the areas of cost of quality, office waste, root cause analysis, performance measurement. He has helped others with various ASQ certifications in quality auditing, management and engineering. He has also taught auditing, Lean Six Sigma, cost of quality, statistics and failure modes and effect analysis. He has four ASQ certifications, CQE, CQA, SSBB, CMQOE. He has published uh, three publications by the ASQ Quality Press and they are the Certified Manager of Quality Organizational Excellence Handbook, fifth edition, and this was co-edited by Sandy. The Executive Guide to Understanding and Implementing Quality Cost Programs, Reduce Operating Expenses and Increase Revenue. And the third one is the Principles of Quality Cost, measure, Financial Measures for Strategic Implementation of Quality Management, fourth division, edition. His firm, DC Wood Consulting LLC, has worked with clients in manufacturing, healthcare, and transactional businesses. The company's website is www.dcwood.com consulting.com. And so, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Sandy and Doug. Doug, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Shoba. Just marvelous introduction as before. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to introduce Sandy. Okay, this, this is, we, we split this up, I think, so that Shoba's voice doesn't wear out. Uh, Dr. Sandy Furter is a professor of practice at the Ohio State University in the Department of Integrated Systems Engineering. She's applied Lean Six Sigma systems engineering and, and engineering management tools in healthcare, banking, retail, higher education, and other service industries. And she's achieved the level of vice president in several banking institutions. She previously managed the Enterprise Performance Excellence Center in a healthcare system. Dr. Furderer received her PhD in industrial engineering with a specialization in quality engineering from the University of Central Florida in 2004. She received an MBA from Xavier University and a Bachelor and Master of Science in Industrial and Systems Engineering from Ohio State University. Dr. Furter has over 25 years of experience in business process and, and quality improvements. She's an ASQ certified Peace. manager. What's that? Sorry, noise there. Okay, she's an ASQ certified manager quality slash organizational excellence. She also has a certified Six Sigma Black Belt. She has a CQE from ASQ and uh, she's an ASQ fellow. And she also is a certified Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Good for you. Uh, Dr. Furter is an author or co-author of several academic journal articles, conference proceedings, and nine reference textbooks on Lean Six Sigma, Design for Six Sigma, Lean Systems, and Systems Engineering, including being the, the co-editor as you know of the CQIA handbook and the CMQOE handbook, and also, as mentioned, the ASQ CQPA handbook. We will talk more about the CQPA at the end of today's talk. She also uh, published a textbook on systems engineering, holistic life cycle architecture, modeling, and design with real world applications. Okay, so Sandy, let's begin. Is that? All right, so I want to get a little bit of background of uh, how Doug and I came about to, to put on this. Uh, particular webinar or um, so he he um, came to me several months ago and he said, oh, Sandy, I've been reading the certified quality process analyst handbook that you edited recently and that came out. And he's like, oh, it's really cool. You put some cool stuff in there about systems and integration and process management. Yeah, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And he said, why don't we um, do some webinars together on this? And I thought, wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. And of course, um, my biggest problem in life has always been that I just don't know how to say no. So, <laughs> so, so I was like, okay, I'll do this. Uh, 
anyway, and when we came to this one, um, the the tools, uh, you know, most people have seen these tools and most people have used these tools. You know, they're considered the seven basic quality tools. You can see, um, well, I added one um, in the con in in to kind of put a different context to it is to really focus on the integrated. I added sidewalk. But flow charts or process maps, check sheets, Pareto charts, histograms, cause and effect diagrams, run charts, and control charts are the seven basic quality tools. And so we thought, well, how do we make this really a little bit different and perhaps a little more beneficial and valuable to people that have seen these tools quite a bit and, and practice these tools quite a bit as well? And we came across the concept of really connecting to the system. We remember Deming system. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So that's really the focus of this is, is not only using um, my new department's name <laughs> that I just recently joined Ohio State with the, they used to be industrial and systems engineering and then they changed their department some at some point to integrated systems engineering. Um, you know, everything seems to be systems. Uh, systems are getting more complex. So the really important thing is to tie these tools together to really leverage the information that you're using across these. So if you wanna go on to the next one, Doug. So this is my attempt at developing a, a framework to really um, help people understand how these tools are connected. And honestly, there could be a lot of other arrows going back and forth and feedback loops and, and so forth. Because one thing I remember um, Chad Smith, who's, who's a, a quality guru, I worked with him at Walmart, and he always used to talk about, um, you know, the DMAIC process where you have define, measure, analyze, improve, control. Well, he always talked about uh, the MAMA part of it, the, the going from define, measure, analyze, and going back to measure and going to analyze. So there was a MAMA in there. <laughs> um, and it, it was really kind of that feedback loop and understanding that you've got to collect more data and go back and analyze it and so forth. So I, there, there are obviously probably a lot of feedback loops that I didn't represent here. So we start, um, I, I mapped it to the phases of DMAIC, not that you only can use these tools, obviously using DMAIC, you can use them using any other problem solving approach, process improvement, um, a lot of other, um, you can use them separately um, in, in different situations if you want to, but the, the, um, the concept is you, you kind of start with defining the problem. And I always, I always help my students. Uh, I, I, um, I teach them to, to scope with the SIPOC to really identify the scope from a process perspective, from the um, understanding who should be involved in the project and what kind of information, knowledge, equipment, materials, and so forth you're using. So all that information can go into the tools that are typically used in the measure phase, process maps, so you get more detail about the inputs and outputs and the roles, who's gonna be doing what, what are the activities. And you also understand, start to understand what are the factors that impact my process and what are the defects that you might have. And then it, depending upon if you have attribute data or variable data, you might, uh, use a check sheet to collect data, either in a manual or automated fashion. And then you can uh, summarize that and understand those critical few that are causing the problems in a Pareto chart. Or you can display your data and help, help to understand outliers and variation in the histograms. All of that then really feeds into the cause and effect diagram or the cause and effect analysis that helps us to understand the causes of the problems. And then being able to really improve the process and dig a little bit more into the analysis as far as what are the trends, what is happening to my process over time, and then can I, can I get gain control? Is my process stable? And so that kind of helps with the control of the process. So that's how we kind of saw this framework and it's really important to understand it's it's not just using the tools, but using the information in an integrated fashion that you're learning from each of these tools. So you can 
Go ahead, Doug. So, um, I don't even know if Doug saw this. I kind of threw this in there. <laughs> so this is actually a picture that my son took when we were at the Cincinnati Museum Center, and we were we were going to a special uh, exhibit on ancient Egypt, and we go into the the um, the exhibit, and the first thing I saw, and it's not very big. It's just probably about I don't know, maybe five by seven, like a piece of paper kind of thing. And it's a picture of Pahari's tomb. So Pahari was like a, a manager, a supervisor back in ancient Egypt. And he's actually uh, can be seen over there, the, the guy on the left with, with that staff there. And so he came to, he, he was a supervisor of people who were farming and doing different activities in ancient Egypt. So that was his job to make sure that they were they were planting uh, the, the the crops, they were harvesting the crops, they were storing the crops, all of this kind of stuff. And I realized, wow, this is a system. And this is from ancient Egypt, right? And so uh, my son took a picture of it. It's the west wall of the tomb of Pahari. It's difficult to see here, but you can Google this and um, it, there's a lot of, of uh, explanation around this, but it was pretty cool because it's like, it's all the activities. It's the people who perform the activities. It's pictures of them performing these activities. And it's the integration across all of these activities. So I thought that was pretty cool because it's, you know, they were thinking system way back when. Um, it's just, we, we think that it got invented, um, you know, over the last 50 years or so, but really it's been a lot longer. So it's pretty cool. So another view of a system to kind of start with, you know, how, how, how the, analysis starts when we're trying to focus on improving processes and Deming, of course, he always talked about a system and he had his view of a production system and I adapted this view for healthcare. And so the examples that Doug and I are going to be talking about today are, are going to be applied in an emergency department. So I wanted to just show you the big picture of this, what the system looks like kind of from the black box view of it. And so, of course, um, for many of you may know um, that this production system view of Deming really was the first time that we, we got the concept of the SIPOC. I'm not sure who's credited, if anybody knows out there, with actually taking kind of creating the SIPOC. I've never seen really a name attached to it. Like we've seen names attached to the cause and effect diagram and Ishikawa's and, and, and so forth. But um, it definitely, uh, the concept um, easily could have been derived from Deming's view of production system because he started over there on the left where you've got your suppliers. And in this case, you've got a lot of different people who provide inputs and outputs and services to the healthcare system. So obviously you've got patients that come to the hospital, uh, come to the healthcare system, and in our case, it's gonna be um, being treated uh, at the emergency department. And then we've got physicians who treat them. We've got other medical staff, a whole slew of medical staff. We also have a lot of ancillary staff, like people who, who will take images, who, who will do a, a CT scan, an MRI, those types of things. We've also got vendors who provide all those, those equipment, all the technology, um, all of the materials and the supplies and, and um, the pharmaceuticals. We've got other facilities who might send their patients here. Um, we, we might have um, a, a, nursing cent a nursing home that sends their patients to the emergency department. We, um, yeah, we also have a pharmaceutical company. So, and then those inputs I've got there, it's a uh, patient comes in, they tell us what's wrong with them. They give us some information so we can bill them later and so forth. Also, there's a lot of knowledge being transferred in a healthcare system, obviously, and applied. And then the expertise, and I talked about equipment, supplies, materials, patients, pharmaceuticals, and I'm sure there's a lot more, but I just wanted to identify the high level. And then all of these come together into our healthcare system and we have lots of different processes. So in the case of the emergency department, patients are arriving, they're being triaged, um, there's intake for the patients, there's care for the patients, there's, they get disposed, they get admitted, they get discharged. There's a whole lot of testing. 
And we also test these processes, the equipment, the methods. And then the patients hopefully go back out to the community. Um, and then there's also the feedback loop where you can have medical research. I'm sure the vendors and the, the medical device manufacturers all have that kind of research into new products. And that's all designed. And then we receive all of that and test the, all the materials, the procedures, the equipment, and so forth. So a couple different views of a production system, and this kind of starts big picture. Okay, so then we go into the side POC, and this is just the high level steps of a side POC. Typically what I what I tell my students is that they should be looking for the five to seven high level steps of, that are part of the process we're trying to improve. Because when students first start thinking about Lean Six Sigma or learning about Lean Six Sigma, they, they're kind of like, well, what am I trying to solve? And I always try to get them to, under, to, to think about what is the process that has a problem that you're trying to solve? So you may be focused on the quality of a process or a product, but it always comes back to their activities that are being performed that need to be improved. So if there's something wrong in the design of a product, we might have to improve that design process. If it's in the manufacturing, we might have to just to improve the manufacturing. And in a service process like the emergency department, it's definitely we're improving all of these activities that are performed and perhaps the handoff of acti the activities. And so for our side POC, the high level steps uh, for the emergency department are to triage a patient, register the patient, treat the patient, test and diagnose the patient, disposition them. They might be transported either out or to the, uh, to, to the uh, inpatient floor of a hospital. So this side pocket is so powerful because it helps us to scope our process and our project. I, I always kind of went back and forth as far as, do you do this in the defined phase? Do you have enough information? Or do you kind of wait and do this in the measure phase? And I pushed it up closer to the define because I think it's important for the, for the students, for anyone learning this, to understand that you're really scoping not only the process steps, but you're identifying in the suppliers and customers, the people who are involved in improving the, the processes and in performing the processes. And then you're also understanding at this point, the inputs and outputs. So it really helps you to, to scope and to, if you do a stakeholder analysis, it helps you to make sure there's a match between your customers and, and uh, suppliers and your stakeholders that you've identified who should be on that team. So here's a, an example a little bit further of the detail of the SIPOC. And you can see the SIPOC stands for Supplier Input Process Output and Customer. And we've got the suppliers that provide inputs to the processes. And then there are outputs that come out of each step of the process and they're provided to a customer. Now, one thing that becomes apparent is that a lot of times the list of suppliers are also the same as the list of customers because you've got this integrated continual handoff between the process steps. So, you know, the patient provides information and then they, that information then goes to the physicians and then they're providing additional information to be tested and they're, they're being tested and they get test results. So it just becomes kind of a, a, a loop um, all the way through these process steps. And the way you develop this is you kind of start in the middle. It might seem counterintuitive, but it always helps again to define what are the activities or the steps that I'm trying to improve, write those down first, then go backward and say, okay, what inputs, what's, what information, what equipment, materials, supplies, et cetera, am I using in that process step and who's giving it to me? And then what comes out of that process step, hopefully what is positively beneficially transformed, and then who do I give it to next? So this really helps people to understand the connectivity early on in the process improvement effort of who's involved and um, who's, who, who needs to be on our team as well. Okay, so this is my little, uh, 
an attempt at, at automation. We'll see how this goes. So I just want to show you that these suppliers, they're listed, encircled, and the customers will be, become our list of our customers and stakeholders. So then these become the stakeholders that if you do a stakeholder analysis, which we won't, won't talk about really today, but this becomes our list of people who have a stake in our process. So we want to have a representative of each of our stakeholder groups in some way or fashion on our team, um, on our process improvement team. So we need to make sure for patients that we have their voice so that we understand them, that we collect data from them, collect um, their perceptions, uh, what their needs. And then we have other representatives of physicians and medical stand, staff and ancillary staff and so forth. And then uh, go ahead, Doug. There should be another arrow. And then, yeah, showing that those are the customers. So it's nice because you're, uh, again, you're making a, a, a consolidated list, and this can help you to do your stakeholder analysis. All right, now let's go to the process map. So the stakeholder analysis starts at a very high level, at the very high level, five to seven steps, no decisions in there or anything like that, that we then move into understanding more detail about the process we're trying to improve. So if you wanna go to the next one. So this is um, a process map template um, that uh, myself and a colleague had, had put together, kind of gone over, go, go, gone through several versions of this. And it sort of looks like a swim lane process map, but it helps to provide, I also call it a process architecture map because it provides the information um, and the equipment and the technology uh, that I need to use in my process. So I first have the activities. I have three rows of activities starting at the left, kind of going across the page and down. And this is where you start to have decisions. I always use my big D's for delays because it, it pulls your eyes to those inefficiencies. Also where you make decisions, it helps you a lot of times, that's where the process gets stuck. So it helps you to understand where that happens. It also helps you to see where things kind of start going around in circles and, and um, maybe inefficient there. And then you notice here, there's two paths into the process where patients enter as they walk into the ER, and then they also might be transported in by ambulance. Um, and then for this particular one, we can also go to additional processes, which are those, those gold boxes as well that can go to different to additional pages. And then the next, the um, next row uh, or swim lane are the roles or the stakeholders. So anybody listed here should have been listed in our SIPOC as a supplier or a customer. And if they aren't, then we can add them back. Um, and then a lot of times we might notice that we, we uh, identified somebody in the role that we aren't talking to. And so we know that either we need to add them to the team or at least talk to them about their process. And then in this one, we in the next lane, we have the information, the technology, and the technology that's used in the process. So I, I've um, also um, done software development um, in my in my past life, and um, so this really is is guided for understanding how you can better use the entire system. So it's not just about the activities that are performed, but how much. How can you better use the technology? There's, there, you're never going to escape technology in a process. And so a lot of the improvements uh, come about because we're understanding the information and the technology that's used, and we're proposing better approaches to that, to be a more seamless connection and better use of the technology. Okay, so this just shows again the activities. This is a listing of all the activities, the process steps. So go ahead, Doug. And these are the the roles there, and then who are the stakeholders, and then the next one, and then this is the information and the technology. 
So this becomes our listing of our architecture. And in this format, I have another slide or, or a cover page that, that summarizes those. So this is actually um, kind of multi-purpose because it could be used if you, if you say, oh, we've got to put new technology in to better manage uh, maybe the imaging appointments or something like that. Well, you can understand who's potentially using that, how they're using it, and what information they're using as well. Okay, when do you take over, Doug? Is this right where you do? Um, I can, if you wish, or. Well, no, I, I mean, if, oh, no, I was supposed to go through the right? A couple more, a couple more. Okay, okay. I was just, I couldn't find my notes. Okay, so the check sheet. So now um, we're, get, we're getting solidly into the measure. Of course, the process maps are used um, in, in the measure phase as well, but the check sheet is gonna help us to collect data on our defects. And it's, again, it's when you've got defect types, which are attributes in our process, and we get counts of how often those defects happen. A lot of times, especially when we're improving processes, we're looking at things in a different way that nobody has possibly looked at our process. And so they may not have the type of defect data that you're looking for to dig into the problems. Oh, I did wanna say one more thing on the process maps as well, as that another part of the value of a process map is I've had several projects where the clients have said, boy, I, I'm fine, now I've got my value already just in the process map phase um, because I now understand the process and how convoluted it is and who are all the players and what they do and the fact that there's a lot of variability in my process. Every, every project manager does things a little bit different that you know they could, they could be happy if they stop then, but we go on and we give them actual value and improvement ideas as well. But um, I've had a lot of people who never talk to each other um, all of a sudden be in the same room developing these process maps and reviewing these process maps and and say that, wow, I never realized that you needed that information and that, and that um, I could easily give it to you um, much more quickly and earlier in your process. And there's great aha moments as well. So, uh, Doug, if you want to go on to the next one. So again, you have already um, in your process map have started to identify the factors and to identify where the defects and the, the problems are occurring. So this check sheet is gonna help you to generate what are the different defect types. And a lot of times it's, it's a guess, right? Because we might not know at this point if we've never collected data on this. So a lot of times, I didn't put it here, but a lot of times there's an other category. So it's the catch all for saying, oh, I didn't think of those other kinds. And then sometimes you find that you've got a, cat, a defect type that has a lot of uh, uh, frequency of defects and you have to add it later on and start collecting it. So I've used defect, um, you know, just about everywhere in a process. I've used them in, in a lot of service processes where people will go through file folders. Um, I've used this in banking where where in the mortgage application process, they actually pull out folders of documentation and count the number of defects and the types of defects uh, in the applications. What's missing, what, what's um, defective, what had to be fixed. So that's a lot of times it's the digging and being able to use this in a kind of manual effort or an Excel sheet uh, effort and then counting these up. And then we move into the Pareto chart where this helps us to, to um, of course, summarize our defect data. You've probably all heard of the 80-20 rule that was um, developed by um, uh, Pareto back in, um, I think it was the 1600s in Italy where he found that 20% uh, of the people had 80% of the wealth. Well, we, we've seen that go to about what, one to 99 these days. But uh, so we, I guess we have to have a new, new principle, <laughs> the one to 99 principle. But this one says about 20% of the defect types or causes contribute to 80% of the defects in our process. So we're using data from that check sheet that use data from understanding of our factors and problems and defects in our process map. 
where we started with the SIPOC scoping our process. So we can see the integration of, of the information that's going through um, and use, and we're using these different tools. So the tools have a different purpose, but we're still using the information seamlessly um, through the process of improvement. So this is an example of patient disposition. So we wanted to understand in the emergency department, what percent of the patients were discharged and which what percent of the patients were admitted to the hospital. And then there were a few other categories. There were some people that left against medical advice. There were some that left without that left before they even saw a physician and so forth. And so we just wanted to understand, you know, where are the patients potentially going as they get out of the emergency department? Because a lot of the issues in the emergency department were the fact that the patients got got held into the emergency department when they didn't have enough staff, nursing staff on the inpatient floor. And since there was a large percentage of patients that needed to get admitted to the hospital, um, we had to solve that project problem. And we there also um, were a lot of issues with patients, um, uh, patient volume surging, and we didn't have enough capacity at certain times of the day or the night or the weekend. So. Um, so this helped us to really understand that where some defects were and then what what part of the process that we could focus on. All right, okay. this is Doug. Yeah, <laughs> here we go. So now that we've worn your voice out. Um, <laughs> so when you have a pile of data, you need to understand it. Okay, uh, two tools help with that histograms and time series plots. Okay, in a histogram, you can see the center of the data, the spread of the data, and how the values are, are, are distributed on either side of the average. Now, before you get to the histogram, you need to collect the data, that is, check sheets and surveys and measured values that we've been, that Sandy's been talking about here. Uh, let, let's take a look at uh, two sets of data. What can we see in here? Well, we can see a lot. Um, histograms of the data were generated for patients who were discharged from the emergency room after receiving care and those that were admitted as inpatients to the hospitals. Additionally, the histogram was generated of patients that were held in the ED. The figures here show a histogram of the total length of stay of these two groups of patients, either discharge or admission. The histogram shows the distribution of the patients, indicating the, general, the central tendency and the graphical variation between them. On these two charts, the red lines are created by the software. In this case, it's Minitab. Uh, Minitab generated these plots of what a normal curve might look like. Now, this allows you to see, does this data fit a normal distribution? We can do a lot with a normal distribution, but if the data does not fit that curve, then we need to do some other things, which are beyond the scope of this talk. Now, these two distributions are approximately normal. Do you see any outliers? You see any extreme values here? Odd ones? Yes. On the extreme right on the admissions data, you see there's a couple of a little low level points out there. Okay. Now you want to investigate those data points to see if they are part of your process or something brand new or something acting from the outside. Again, the outliers represent long, very long length of stay. Uh, now, it's not unusual for a histogram to be skewed to the right as you see these uh, because you can't have negative values, okay? You can't go below zero. Therefore, the histogram kind of gets stretched out on the high end a little bit. Another result might show two humps in the data, two high points, okay? Uh, this did not occur here. But if you have a histogram with two or three peaks in it, it means you have multiple processes getting mixed together. You have to separate them in your data before you can make sense out of it. Now, the cause and effect diagram it has two other names. We call it a fishbone chart, or we can call it the Ishikawa diagram after the generator. These three names mean the same thing. This is a brainstorming framework. You use a framework so that you don't leave something out. And sometimes it's hard to think of all the factors that could create causes. Uh, so you would use all of these tools that are listed here, okay? Uh, before you get into a, a cause and effect diagram, because what you're trying to do is to build a mental picture of the situation. 
then the cause and effect diagram will help your team brainstorm. Now, in this example, we analyzed the ED bed board system data to understand the factors that impacted the patient throughout. We stratified the ED bed board data in many ways, like patient demographics or diagnosis or the way patients arrived in the ED, the numbers and types of diagnostic tests performed at acuity levels. And then the team drew the arrow from left to right with a problem in the box on the right, the red long ED length of stay, that was their problem. Now the main bones here represent the six M's. This is commonly used, but if these six M's do not fit your situation, go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia under cause and effect has a whole series of different main bones that, you, that might fit your situation better. Now, when, in this tool, your team then focuses on one main bone at a time. Make sure you do people last. You don't want to get stuck on blaming people for causes. Also, also, there should be no causes under people, like lazy. Can't do anything about that, okay? What are some of the people aspects that you can actually modify? You know, better onboarding, things like that. Now, when you're done with this, now you need to look at which causes drive the others. Uh, the order of causes is not clear here, only that they exist. So you can think about adding these to your flowchart. As Sandy mentioned, you go back and use a flowchart. We mentioned time series charts a while ago when looking at histograms. Uh, and this is the one of the major time series charts, a run chart. Now histograms will not show trends because they do not show time. An outlier in a histogram might be in the middle or it might be something brand new. This is why we say to use both histograms and run charts. Do both of them. Now, the other tools listed here can help provide context to the trends that you see in your run chart. In the case study, the run chart for the ED total length of time, the median was 6.7 hours for the time period from January through July and 4.9 from August to the following July. And this is so obvious here. The average baseline length of stay was 6.9 hours. That is before August, okay? And the improved length of stay was 4.9 hours from August on. Now, a shift was noted in the results after July. The improvement changes were implemented then. So this red line you see here is the median before the change was made. The process had both a higher median and higher variability prior to August. So the project must have had an effect. Now, not only did the length of stay, but the percent who left without being seen, uh, you know, it, it decreased tremendously. It was, it went down from six and a half percent to three and a half percent and eventually to 0.3 percent. Here the red line shows the median after the change. So you can see how the run chart demonstrates a trend. So let's take a look at an example of a control chart, okay? Uh, run charts are a series of individual values. However, if we take a series of samples, not just individual values, now we can look at how the sample averages change and how the sample ranges change. This is the concept behind a control chart, first described by Dr. Walter Schuhart, who taught Dr. Edward Deming. You've heard of Deming. Schuhart was a physicist and engineer and a statistician and the father of statistical quality control. He framed the problem of poor results in terms of assignable cause variation and chance cause variation, two very important concepts. So all the tools here allow you to explain changes in time series chart. So let's take a look at an example of a control chart. You'll notice here that there's a top half and a bottom half. The top chart shows the averages of 25 different samples. Each dot was a sample of triage times listed in the order that they happen. And the bottom chart shows the ranges in those same 25 samples. You see your process can go out of control two different ways, either by averages, too high or too low, or by ranges, too small or too large. The red lines here are not specifications on our triage process. Don't put specification lines on a control chart. These red lines are created from a time period when the process was considered mostly stable. 
using the average and standard deviations of oftentimes 60 sample sets are used for this. These red lines are the upper and lower control limits. Now the magic of control charts lies in a series of rules. If no rule is violated, for example, no points beyond the control limits, that's one of the rules, then the manager is to do nothing. Changes in the process may be shown in the control chart, and then the control charts might need to be recalculated and reset for the new process. Now, in the case study here, the data point on day 12 uh, is outside the mean, you know, the, the upper control limit chart, okay? The averages is the upper chart, and you can see the day 12, it's marked in red, went above the top, top control limit. So something happened on that day. We would use our other tools to determine what happened on that day. Now, th these unusual results could be due to something that affected the process, or they could be a change in the measurement system that was used to collect data on that day. Now, in the case study, the improvement team identified that a very high volume of patients on day 12 led to delays in the triage process. Okay, so that is a change to the outside of the system. You can see the range of triage times became less or had a smaller variation after sample number 17. Changes were made here, and therefore, the variation was reduced. Sandy? Thank you, Doug. So, in summary, um, we, we've seen that the seven traditional quality tools could be used in an independent fashion, but they're going to be so much more effective if you think about them and use them in an integrated fashion. So, if they help us to first starting out with understanding our process and who's involved in our, our process and who's going to be a part of our improvement team. What are the factors and defects that contribute to root causes? What are those root causes? And then ultimately, how are we going to be able to generate and sustain improvements? So linking that data that runs through the quality tools is really critical to improvement success. Oh, and, and before I go, I want to say one thing. Um, those are the references. Um, so uh, Shova did mention that you you're going to see our contact information that you can send us an email to to get a copy of the slides, a PDF of the slides. Um, I, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Doug is much quicker responding to emails, so you may absolutely copy me, <laughs> but Doug's going to be the one that's going to get the the uh, presentation to you quick. <laughs> All right. So we wanted to introduce this series, where we came up with this series here, okay? Uh, this is the cover of the handbook, and this talks, this is uh, from ASQ Press. Uh, we've got a link down at the bottom. Uh, it is uh, ASQ Press H1579 is the handbook. Uh, this is not a well-known certification from ASQ, but it is, it, it's, possibly one of the most overlooked ones. It is highly valuable. I would argue for anyone in a process role, you know, a, uh, a business manager, uh, anywhere, this is, this is the certification for you, all right? Five sections, we're covering some highlights in the series. Not all of it, just highlights. Anything you wanna add, Sandy? I think that's great. Well, other than you can also think of the certified quality process analyst as kind of a continuum from somebody that might start at the certified quality improvement analyst, go into the certified quality process analyst, and then this will help prepare you for the CQE and then potentially also for the certified manager quality and organizational improvement. And then, um, and, and also then you've got the the green belts and black belt types of certifications, but this is nice and vast and it and covers uh, a really broad spectrum of all the quality tools. And so you'll be very well prepared to really enhance your career if, if you uh, look into this certification. Thank you. So we've got a conversation all set up in LinkedIn. Uh, if you wanna to go to LinkedIn, I've got a tiny URL here. 
Uh, we'll be watching that LinkedIn site uh, for comments and we'll be answering them. So if you want to continue the conversation, just go here. Here's our contact information. And I, I'm sorry, Sandy's email is shorter than mine. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you'll get our contact information in the email in 48 hours. So with that, I think we're done, Sandy, right? Yes, you, Doug and Sandy, we'll take up the questions that, you know, that have been coming through. So let's start with the first one. Do you think the quality tools you discussed are still relevant in quality 4.0? Have you noticed any new or emerging quality tools? Hmm. Yeah, I can kind of jump in there first and then Doug, you can, can jump in later, but I think, I think they still are. And even if you automate, because I kind of alluded to that in the check sheets, even if you have an automated way of, of downloading the defects from, from your database that you're using, or many databases that you're using, I still think it's a powerful concept to think about. You really want to define and you want to brainstorm together the defects with your team of the subject matter experts. So even if you're able to download data from some database and and be able to understand where the defects are, there still is that knowledge and that subject matter expertise that's still needed about the process. So I still think the concept conceptually, it's still very powerful. And then the other thing that I mentioned was a lot of times nobody's collected data like that, so they don't even know where it exists. So a lot of times you start manually and then you set up your measurement system to be able to collect this in a more automated fashion. And that's really where it connects to the power of business analytics, data analytics and quality 4.0. Absolutely, Sandy. The, these tools are flexible and manual. And before you go to quality 4.0, you gotta know your stuff. <laughs> and this helps you gather that. Shoba, next question. All right, the next oh, question. I wanted, um, oh, Shoba, oh, I just wanted oh, to add oh, one more thing that Doug uh, mentioned the other day when we were talking about this presentation is the control charts. If you automate your control charts, a lot of the software out there will automatically change your control limits with every additional subgroup added. You might not want that to happen. So you also have to be careful you need to understand what these control charts are doing first before you automate them. Thanks. Okay. Next question is, what quality tools do you use the most and which tools do you use the least? I can say the most, flowchart. Absolutely, flowchart. Uh, if, if you don't do flowcharts, everybody's on a different page. Uh, a flowchart can be incorporated with lots of these things, as you saw with her process maps. Okay, uh, you can <clears throat> you can attach all kinds of stuff to a flowchart. In in terms of the least, my thought would be formal control charts. Okay, because there's a lot to set up to do that well, um, and. It, it's only flow, uh, control charts are useful when you have a consistent process that's running for a period of time. Uh, if your processes change all the time, then control. Sandy, you got anything to add? No, I totally agree with you. Process map is the the first and and foremost tool that I found the most powerful, and I agree with that because not everybody's on the same page and won't understand the process if you don't do that. And then on the the flip side, I agree totally with your control chart. I love control charts. The first time I got interested in quality was when I took an SBC class in my undergrad. And, 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 and I actually um, was able to get pregnant through a control chart because I tracked when I ovulated on so, <laughs> a control chart. So I love control charts. My daughter's here because of a control chart, but, um, too much but information, again, Sandy. Too I know, much information. I know, I'm sorry. It's a funny story. It's real geeky, right? Real geeky. But anyway, um, so yeah, so uh, I I agree. It's it's more difficult to really leverage the power of control charts. However, with Quality 4.0, I think that there will be a lot more use for it because you're automatically 
um, collecting data off the shop floor. You can automatically feed it into some, some, you know, visual control and um, automated control. So I think control charts will make a resurgence um, at some point. Yep. All right. Next question. Some check sheets measure defects in the process, but don't keep count of them. As the count will be done after the check sheet has been closed and delivered to the responsible manager. Is the count a critical part of the check sheet or is it optional? I, I, I'm thinking here there's maybe some confusion between a checklist and a check sheet. A, a checklist is done during an operation to make sure that everything is done. All the steps are taken. A check sheet is where you actually see the defect and record it. I mean, you wouldn't do a count of defects until they're seen, okay? Now, you might be doing a check sheet in multiple locations because the defects show up in multiple places, and then you're going to have to add them all together, all right? Did, did that answer the question? I'm, I'm not sure if we, if we got that question right. Can I move on to the next, Doug? Sure. Okay. Any suggestions on figuring out sample sizes for business processes, especially when they didn't have any metrics? Most of the time, the team feels defeated and impatient when no data exists, and so we need to build that baseline measurement. Okay. Well, I have an answer on a histogram. The answer is 50. Um, and, and you can play with this on your own. If you take two dice, two six-sided dice, and roll them, that's one sample, and count the dots on it, and plot them on a histogram, and roll again, and again, and again, and again. And you're going to start to see a very blocky diagram form. It will not be a bell curve. But you know when you roll two six-sided dice that it's going to form a bell curve. It absolutely will. That's the whole idea behind seven being the most common combination to that. And so as you roll the dice, you're going to find until you get to 20 rolls, there's no bell curve. So 50 is necessary to get rid of randomness. Sandy? Yeah, and I and I think also kind of embedded in this question is just the fact that nobody's collected data up to this point yet. And that is super, super common. Um, this emergency department study was so unique in the fact that there was a really enlightened um, emergency department physician that had designed the requirements for an in-house bedboard, ED bedboard system that allowed them to have all this amazing data. That is, is very unique. That almost doesn't happen anywhere. And even if, if organizations have the data, they typically don't know they even have it. Because like I'll, I'll uh, have my students working on, on different projects in the hospital and we'll ask for all this data and they're like, wow, we've never seen it like this. We've never investigated that. So I think a lot of it is, just um, you're in a in a six sigma project. You're going to identify your critical to quality characteristics. I usually call them critical to satisfaction because it's usually around quality, timeliness, process could be could be um, cost, safety, and you're going to identify those. Start there with one six sigma project and your two or three critical to quality characteristics metrics related to those and start collecting data over say a three month period. I think you'll easily get to the 50 that Doug talked about. I think that's great. Um, but I think you just have to start one by one, pro one process improvement effort by, by the next one and help them to see the value of, of using that data. I would add every organization has a strategic plan. And if you're trying to solve a problem, you need to talk to your leaders in their language. You need to take your problem, translate it into what they say their strategy is and say, you know, so we want, uh, let's say, uh, you know, profitable revenue growth. 
Okay, that's a typical strategy, right? And you could say, we're not going to grow if we keep making our customers angry. We have to get rid of that anger to be profitable, have profitable growth. So to get that, we're going to have to measure what makes them angry. See, that, that's how you tie your, your data collection to strategy. I'll take one final question. And, you know, if we can get the answer, then I'll have just a few seconds to cover the ending slides. 80-20 rule works. If the standard deviation is twice the mean in the normal distribution, do you think this rule is still okay? Um, I would say in, in my experience, it's close. Sometimes it's 70-30, 30-70. Um, but the important thing is you don't want to be trying to attack everything at the same time. So it really helps you to focus on those those critical few versus they call a trivial many. So it really helps people to understand and and start with where you, you need to focus and design some improvements around those. And then you can work your way down the Pareto chart to the other defects. I, I'll just add to that, that if you've got too many processes you're handling all at once and you have no data to separate out the processes, you could end up with a, a Pareto curve that's just flat, okay? Because you got all these different things going on all at the same time. But if you can get down to one process, okay, one particular series of steps, it's generally going to be 80-20. You know, 20% of the roads carry 80% roads carry of the traffic. 20% of your, your suppliers give you 80% of the grief. That's pretty common. Thank you, Doug and Sandy, for that great presentation and for your questions and answers. I 